Tonight, House of Representatives resolved to end speculations on cost of direct primaries by political parties, invites INEC chairman to brief its committees on the matter. Court orders the DSS to give leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdekanu, maximum possible comfort while in custody. Shift trial to January 18, 2022. Federal government asked states to set up efforts in the ongoing COVID-19 mass vaccination to achieve its target by January 2022. And COVID-19 Omicron variant drives sharp increase in new infections in South Africa. Plus international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, OPEC Plus maintains current oil output plan of 400,000 barrels per day for member countries at the end of its meeting. On sports news tonight, Nigeria's Bosse Omalayo sets new world record in the women's up to 79 kilogram to clinch gold at the World Para Power Lifting Championships in Georgia. And from Abuja, Former President Goodluck Jonathan opens up on some decisions he took while in office. Says he was unaware governors of state where he built our Marjorie schools were unhappy with him. Now against the backdrop of the controversy over what it will cost to hold direct primaries by political parties in the country, the House of Representatives has passed a resolution for the INEC chairman to brief its electoral and appropriations committees on the issue. The motion to invite the INEC chairman was raised by Representative Leke Abejide, who informed the House that it was important to address the rumours of the cost of direct primaries. Our correspondent Terry Kumi has details of this and more, including the move to investigate claims by the ICPC chairman that 257 projects were found to be duplicated in the proposed 2022 budget. It's the final plenary of the week in the Green Chamber. The session commences with a communication from President Muhammad Buhari on the finance bill for consideration and passage. He details what the finance bill is about, which we will circulate to members. Um, I trust that the bill will be favorably considered by the National Assembly for passage into law so that it may provide fiscal support necessary for the implementation of the 2022 federal budget. An urgent motion in response to rumors that it will cost 500 billion naira to conduct direct primaries is raised. This is coming on the heels of the disagreement among the political class on the insistence of the National Assembly through the recently passed Electoral Act Amendment Bill that political parties must conduct their primaries using the direct method. It is important for us to invite the chairman of INEC to meet with the committee of INEC in this Allo chamber and that of appropriation for him to be able to tell them what is going to cost to do this direct primary. In the meantime, following the statement by Chairman of the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission that over 250 projects have been found to be duplicated in the proposed 2022 budget and illegal recruitment in MDAs, lawmakers call for an investigation. Concern that these corrupt practices have diverted the country's revenue meant to be channeled into economic development and capital projects. Let the planning committee check all their capital projects and find out. And Mr. Speaker, let me also add, apart from capital, Mr. Speaker, they should go beyond that and review the overhead. Investigate the level of approvals or waivers for employment for the past five years that have been given by the head of service since the policy on uh, or since the ban on employment. The House mandates the Committee on Anti-Corruption to investigate the issues of nominal roles, payroll padding and fake employment in all MDAs, while it plans to set up an ad hoc committee to investigate the issue of duplication of projects in the coming week. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. 
And to legal matters where the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja has ordered the Department of State Services, DSS, to allow the leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, maximum possible comfort while in their custody. Justice Binten Yako, who gave the order, also brought forward Kanu's trial to 18th January from January 19th, 2022 following the abridgment of time granted by the judge after a plea to that effect. His counsel, Mr. Ifaiye Jofo, had approached the court with an application seeking an order to accommodate the trial in November and December this year as against the earlier date of January 19, 2022. The streets leading to the Federal High Court in the nation's capital appear normal which is unusual whenever the court is set to hear the suit of the federal government against the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Anamdi Kanu. Like the streets, there are no security operatives to restrict access into the courtroom, an indication that Mr. Kanu, who is facing a seven-count charge, will not be in court. His legal team had approached the court seeking for an earlier date for the resumption of the trial, preferably a date before the end of this year. Although the counsel to the federal government, Mr. Schreib Labaran, opposed the application, the presiding judge, Justice Binton Yako, granted the request of Mr. Kanu's lawyers. She also ordered the Department of State Services to allow Mr. Kanu to practice his faith, change his clothes and be given maximum possible comfort in their facility. We raised concerns few days ago, me and my colleague raised concerns few days ago uh, through our press statement about this condition, his condition in, in DSS, how he's been subjected to solitary confinement, how his medical, uh, medical experts are not allowed to see him, how the court orders are being flouted with levity by the SSS officials, at the authority. So we raised those concerns and courts uh, made several orders today. First of all, that his place of detention should be changed to that uh, the judge should allow his medical expert to visit him and they should comply with orders of the court and also provide him with good food and also allow, um, allow persons of his choice to also visit him and allow him to practice his faith because before now he, has been, he hasn't been allowed to practice his faith. And of course we are in court, the court said in the event the detaining authority, the SS, who has been, who has been in the practice of disobeying and violating court orders, uh, flout the other bed by the court today. We should come back to court anytime when that is done. The trial has been adjourned to January 18th for hearing of pending applications bordering on jurisdiction and competency of the suit. Staying with the judiciary, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, today rearranged the former governor of Ikiti State, Ms. Ayodele Fayoshe, and his company, Spotless Limited, before a federal high court sitting in Lagos. Ms. Fayoshe and company were rearranged before Justice Chukuje Kuaneke on 11 count charge bordering on money laundering and non declaration of assets. In the amended charge, Mr. Fayoshe and one Abiodun Agbele, who is also standing trial on alleged money laundering offences before another division of the court, are alleged to have on June 17, 2014, taken possession of 1.2 billion naira to fund Mr. Fayoshe's 2014 governorship campaign in Ekiti State. They were accused of committing criminal breach of trust, theft and stealing of public funds. They pleaded not guilty and were permitted to continue on the earlier bail granted them. The trial continues tomorrow before Justice Aneke with the EFCC expected to call its 12th witness to testify against the accused. And more on the judiciary, the Court of Appeal sitting in Ibadan, the Oyo State Capital, has discharged and acquitted a former governor of the state, Adebayo Alao Akala, and two other persons over 11.5 billion naira corruption charges levelled against them by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Justice Minuru Owulabi struck out eight of the 11 count charge against Alao Akala and two others and ordered the former governor to enter his defence for the remaining three counts, which border on cons conspiracy, obtaining money by false pretenses, award of contract without budgetary provision. The litigation, which started 11 years ago, was concluded by a three-man panel presided over by Justice Jimmy Ulukayode Bada.
And away from the courts, it appears more federal civil servants are now complying with the federal government's directive to get the jabs against COVID-19. This comes as the enforcement of the order on the no vaccination card or evidence of negative PCR test, no entry into public offices, entered a second day today. However, some are asking the federal government to review the process of implementing the mandatory vaccination. Our correspondent Emperor Simon reports. This COVID-19 vaccination stand situated meters away from the Federal Secretariat Abuja complex began a mass vaccination exercise days before the December 1st deadline by the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, which mandates all civil servants to present a vaccination card or evidence of a negative PCR test done within 72 hours before being allowed into their offices. Since the enforcement exercise commenced, more persons are coming to the stand to get vaccinated. We have successfully vaccinated over 500 people since Monday and today is on Thursday. So today too we are looking forward to getting really good numbers. While some of those who took the vaccine say they feel compelled to do so, others say it was a matter of volition. Since government say we should take it, so we take it. If that will bring an end to the COVID, we have to abide. I just felt now is not the best time to do it. Meanwhile, enforcement of the federal government's directive continues, with many people restricted from gaining access to public facilities. First and foremost, you should know the medical uh, history of each and every one of your staff before you know who is uh, eligible to collect this vaccine or not. Those who are concerned should write to all the permanent secretaries in the country, particularly here in Abuja or wherever. The permanent secretaries will have the responsibility to inform all their staff. Some question the conduct of those enforcing the directive. You can imagine the security officials asking people to go back because of vaccination. Are they vaccinated? Do they have even their nose marks? They don't. So I don't know the criteria for all this. Do you understand? Because I don't believe you should force people to do this. As the federal government insists on enforcing the directive by the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19, some of these civil servants want the implementation process reviewed. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the federal government is asking states to key into the ongoing COVID-19 mass vaccination exercise in order to reach the target of the eligible population by January next year. Minister of Health Dr. Sage Hanire made the appeal at the Special National Council on Health meeting in Abuja. The Minister of Health, Dr. Sagie Ehanire, is chairing the special National Council of Health meeting in Abuja with commissioners of health, development partners and heads of relevant agencies in the sector. It's the first physical meeting of the council since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Nigeria last year and for some of the participants, it provides an opportunity to reflect and build back stronger. COVID-19 indeed taught us a lesson. It's all about preparedness, preparedness, and preparedness. And if we neglect that aspect, we might see in the near future the same catastrophe we witnessed with COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister of Health appeals to states to key into the ongoing mass COVID-19 vaccination exercise of the federal government in order to attain the needed herd immunity by the end of January next year. A mass vaccination exercise aimed to reach 50% of eligible populations by, gen by end of January 2022 is underway. But vaccine skepticism is still an issue and states have a role to play. Honorable State Commissioners must therefore continue to work strategically with the federal organs 
to address this problem and other challenges. The council played a pivotal role in the 2014 National Health Act, a legislation many say can address the challenges facing the sector if implemented. The National Health Act 2014 has provisions that can turn around our healthcare systems, but the challenge is implementation. Therefore, it is our collective responsibility to ensure that we maximize the provisions of this law through the full operationalization. The outbreak of COVID-19 no doubt exposed the weakness in the country's health sector. And as stakeholders in the sector deliberate on lessons from the pandemic, it is hoped that they will come out with policies that help prepare the sector for future emergencies. In part two after the break, the Rivers chapter of the Nigerian Dental Association seeks special attention to the practice of dentistry in the country to curb brain drain. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. House of Representatives resolves to end speculations on the cost of direct primaries by political parties, invites INEC chairman to brief its committees on the matter. Court orders the DSS to give leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdekanu, maximum possible comfort while in custody. Federal government asked states to set up efforts in the ongoing COVID-19 mass vaccination to achieve its targets by January 2022. And COVID-19 Omicron variant drives sharp increase in new infections in South Africa. Staying with health matters, there is an urgent need for the federal and state governments to give special attention to the practice of dentistry in the country to curb brain drain. This is the view of dentists and other stakeholders at the opening of the 2021 Annual General Meeting of the River State Chapter of the Nigerian Dental Association, which held in Port Harcourt, the state capital. Experts say the current rate of brain drain in the sector is bad for a country where millions of people are in dire need of dental care. It's a gathering of dental health experts, stakeholders and students at the annual general meeting of the River State Chapter of the Nigerian Dental Association and the third memorial lecture in honor of Dr. Ernest Dublin Green the first dental practitioner to serve in Nigeria's public service. Thank you. I will appreciate you and the focus of this year's meeting is to explore variables in managing the dental health of persons with special needs who are reported to have suffered neglect and discrimination. We are limited, you know, let's not be so rigid and, you know, doctor, you know, we wear a white coat and want to be doctors. No. A pediatric dentist also calls for policy reforms and provision of incentives to endear practitioners to care for people with special needs and curb brain drain in the sector. When you are getting a surgery ready for children with special needs, you should create a space for the wheelchair. You should also create a place for emergency. We have to do emergency resuscitation or emergency within the clinic. So you naturally require large um, surgeries. The theme for this year's lecture is expanding the boundaries of dental practice in Nigeria. A scholar is challenging professionals to reach for the stars. I don't see why a dentist who has been trained in university and so on should think that his own boundary begins and ends with his own hospital practice. No, they can do it can be anything. If you want that you go to school, can do anything. I don't see why a dentist can't do it, be anything. You understand? The boundaries are short, sure, they are uncountable. You can go any direction. Meanwhile, late Dr. Green's daughter says her father epitomizes selfless service that should be emulated. He's been endeared. His legacy is, is being set so that this nation, other people learn from that it is hard work that, um, that helps other people, that um, it is appreciated when you serve this nation so well. 
The experts are hoping that the federal and state governments will be inspired by the dedication of the likes of Dr. Ernest Dublin Green to improve the sector. Let's go over to Abuja. We have more stories there. Here's Magwe Ogun Yusuf with more. Hello, Magwe. Hello, Millicent. We'll start with some revelation here as former President Goodluck Jonathan has been speaking about some of the decisions he took while in office. While delivering a graduation lecture to Executive Intelligent Management Course 14 at the National Institute for Security Studies in Abuja, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan explains that he had no idea governors of states where he built the Amajiri schools were unhappy with him. He also explains why he placed a call to President Muhammadu Buhari to congratulate him for winning the 2015 presidential election. Our correspondent Kayla Megwa reports. For the past 10 months, these 66 students, drawn from several security-affiliated agencies, have been at the National Institute for Security Studies, Abuja, upgrading their competence to handle security challenges in the country. Presenting the graduation lecture, the former president speaks on the Almadiri schools he created while in office to reduce the number of out-of-school children. When I was in office, I have to step in at the time to even attempt to build some schools. They now call them uh, Almadiri schools. I know that some of the governors probably were not too happy, but then they didn't tell me they were not happy. <laughs> it was when I left office that I had that. But how will the governor not happy? Because we use the federal government money from the university of basic education and just to partner with the state. He goes on to explain the roles local authorities should play in reducing ethnic and religious crisis. In terms of governance, nothing is happening at the local government level. The community engagement is so weak. I think the states must have strong departments that will coordinate the affairs of this local government. The former president insists that political conflict frightens investors, recalling the now famous phone call he made to President Muhammadu Buhari to quell tensions in the country following the outcome of the 2015 presidential elections. Nobody can bring his money to invest in a country where it's not politically stable. And one of the reasons why, as you mentioned, I call Buhari before the announcement of the results. I don't want a situation where people can pre them. For the former president, whistleblowing is a great tool to fight corruption. However, he calls for caution. Who give wrong information to security operators should be punished. In as much as the issue of whistleblowing is okay, it will help to control us must be done in a way that we should not use it to injure our economy. Today's lecture from former president Gulok Abele Jonathan was packed full of information on all kinds of things. There is no word yet on whether the former president will be thinking of running for president in the next elections, but the eyes are on him to see what his next moves are. For now, he's more focused on conducting elections across Africa. Kayla Megua, Channels Television News. The president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akimumi Adishino, is asking the federal government to show the masses the benefits of taxation before embarking on plans to increase its tax regime. Dr. Adishino, who was speaking at the 51st annual ICANN conference in Abuja, took a swipe at those comparing the nation's tax to GDP ratio to countries such as Norway where the tax-to-GDP ratio is low but has succeeded in providing better livelihoods for its people. It's the second time accountants will be gathering this year for their annual conference. This time, the theme bothers on building public trust in governance, and accountants from all walks of life, including government officials, are here as they bear their minds on the issue. One of the key issues discussed is how the COVID-19 pandemic led to a decline in public trust of governance globally, thereby exposing the many shortfalls of the government and the private sector alike. Restoring trust in governance benefits all in diverse ways and creates a society where there is increased social order, labor harmony, inclusive growth, and development and enhances international trade, commerce 
and foreign direct investment. An analysis by the World Bank on the trust in political office holders in Nigeria for the year 2012, for instance, came to about 2.2 and further declined to 1.5 in 2017. The president of the Africa Development Bank, Dr. Akiomi Adishino, who speaks during the plenary session, condemns the call to increase the nation's tax to GDP ratio. He says the tax system should translate into better livelihoods for Nigerians before it is increased. While tax rates are relatively low in Nigeria, it simply is not an excuse to keep increasing taxes, however. Citizens do not have access to basic services that governments should provide as part of the social contracts. There were also recommendations on how the government can gain public trust going forward. People have lost faith in the public systems. And when you search deeper to the root cause of this problem, you will find out that the lack of accountability is at its core, and a reinvigorated public financial management reforms will help us to deliver accountability and to re-establish trust. Transparency and accountability, good governance and active citizens' participation remains a critical ingredient to achieving public trust. It is expected that resolutions reached here will help inform the government on how to better build public trust in the years to come. When the news at 10 returns, OPEC Plus maintains current oil output plan of 400,000 barrels per day for member countries at the end of its meeting. That's some business news. Do join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. Boosting agriculture and enhancing economic development is key to the establishment of the Bank of Industry in Ikiti State. This is central to the visit of the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Adini Adebayo, who along with officials of the bank and the governor of Ikiti State, Dr. Kayade Fayemi, applauded the initiative at the commissioning of the facility. Governor Fayemi promised the support of the Ikiti State government for the Bank of Industry. I commission this local branch of the Bank of Industry to the glory of God and the benefit of all our people in this state. Amen. The State Office of the Bank of Industry makes it the 29th Bank of Industry office across the country. And the aim is to bring support closer to businesses and take micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs, to higher climbs. The bank is hopeful that businesses in Ekiti State will maximize the opportunity to recover from the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic, as the Bank of Industry will give them the best support. We are optimistic that the opening of this office shall consolidate our partnership that we have developed over the past several years towards expanding the mutual benefits of micro, small and medium enterprises in the state. Dr. John Kayode Fayemi. The governor, Dr. Kayode Fayemi, describes the Bank of Industry as outstanding and a desirable outfit for any forward-looking state. And he draws attention to the reluctance of some Ekiti people to taking loans, hoping a season of reorientation has come. Most successful businesses, they start with business support. And the Bank of Industry has carved a niche for itself to support young businesses, thriving businesses, in order to continue to improve uh, on what they provide. For the minister, agriculture is central to Ikiti State economy, and the presence of the Bank of Industry will be a blessing to farmers and the state. The opening of this new office would positively impact the economy of our state, as it is positioned to support the processing of our cocoa into chocolate, our oil palm to, to palm oil production, our cassava to ethanol, starch, high quality cassava flour, and so on. The stakeholders here are in agreement that an enabling environment and easy access to capital will greatly encourage business and enhance economic growth.
And in security matters, the Edo State Police Command has confirmed the release of the Divisional Police Officer of Fuga Division in Esako Local Government Area, CSP Ishak Aliu. Mr. Liu was kidnapped last Friday on the Aochi Agenebode Road in Edo North Senatorial District. Meanwhile, police authorities in the state say they are combing the bush to rescue the remaining four of the nine persons kidnapped from a galaxy bus on the Benin Aochi Road yesterday after rescuing five of them. According to the police command, it received information from the vigilante chairman in the area that the passengers were traveling from Ibadan in Oyo State to Urumi in Edo State when persons suspected to be kidnappers, numbering about 20, intercepted their vehicle. On receiving the information, the divisional police officer in charge of Airhor Division, CSP Ben Alfa, swung into action, mobilizing police operatives in collaboration with military and local vigilante for bush combing. Their effort resulted in the freedom of five of the victims. Well, that's all from Abuja, but Teniola Shobowale is standing by to give you details of the outcome of the meeting of OPEC Plus members. Who stay with us. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Malpe. The organization of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies known as OPEC Plus have agreed to maintain their current output policy of 400,000 barrels per day for member countries in January 2022. The decision follows the outcome of its meeting today amid fears over the Omicron COVID-19 variant and a U.S.-led release of strategic reserves from crude importing countries. International benchmark Brent crude futures rose to trade around $69 per barrel, while U.S. West uh, Texas intermediate futures rose to about $66 per barrel. Meanwhile, the Energy Alliance is scheduled to meet next year on January the 4th. Three telecoms companies have received approval from the Nigerian Communications Commission to participate in the final bid for the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum that will be used to deploy the fifth generation 5G technology in the country. The qualified bidders include MTN Nigeria, Mafab Communications Limited and Airtel Networks Limited. In a statement, the NCC mentioned that the qualified bidders have complied with all the regulatory principles of the open and transparent auction. It further notes that they will participate in the compulsory mock auction process and the main auction scheduled for December the 10th and 13th this year. Meanwhile, telecommunications giant MTN has announced that the public offer to retail investors for the sale of up to 575 million shares held in MTN Nigeria by MTN Group will be priced at 169 naira per share. At the launch of the public offer in Abuja, MTN Nigeria Chief Executive Officer Mr. Kyle Toriola says the minimum subscription is for 20 shares and lots of 20 shares thereafter. Top executives of MTN Nigeria, staff members and partners of the company gather in this hall to witness the announcement of a public offer to retail investors of up to 575 million shares, priced at 169 naira per share. It's something I did in January with the approval of the company secretariat, the chairman. Um, Commenting on the prize announcement, the chief executive officer of MTN Nigeria, Mr. Carl Toriola, says the offer is an opportunity for Nigerians to own shares in MTN Nigeria. Our intention, and we hope the press will help us to communicate this as widely as possible, is to build a local shareholder base of more than 2 million Nigerians while we remain focused on building the largest retail shareholder base in the country. The offer, which opens on December the 1st and closes on December the 14th, is the first in the country to be delivered via a digital platform, and it comes with an incentive, as explained by the chief financial officer of the company. The good thing about this offer is that it includes an incentive uh, of one free share for every 20 shares 
you buy or purchase up to a maximum of 250 uh, shares per investor. The public offer of the shares to retail investors by MTN Nigeria Communications PLC is considered of great impact to the country's economy. If we look across Africa and look across MTN's footprint in capital markets across several African countries where they have done uh, issuances like this, we have seen a transformational impact on those markets. MTN's history, you know, of governance and performance really makes this you know, a transaction that is easy to sell. You know, I said something much earlier that if you've never ever bought a share in Nigeria and you were only going to buy one share, this is probably the one. With 68 million subscribers connected to the MTN Group in the last 20 years, this public offer of shares to retail investors is the first in a series of transactions as the MTN Group implements its plan to ensure broad-based ownership by reducing its shareholdings in MTN Nigeria to 65% over time. Well, let's check in on the stock market now. The equities market dipped further in today's trading session. Laddie Williams tells us more. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. It's the second trading day in the new month and the equities performance remains negative for a fourth consecutive session this week. No thanks to extended sell pressure by investors. That growl you heard there signifies the bear's dominance, which is reflected in a 0.51% further drop in the all-share index, which has drifted from the 43,000 point. Now let's put this performance into more perspective. Losses in the share price of uh, MTN Nigeria, Seplat, Lafarge, Zenith Bank, and 27 other decliners led to a 113 billion naira drop in the market's overall value just the day after it dipped by a whopping 409.56 billion naira in the previous session. It's also a sea of red on the sectoral performance chart of listed equities as the impact of the sell-off was felt across all the counters on the NGX. These are certainly uncertain times for the uh, domestic boss, particularly as the year enters its final days. But traders say there's still no need to panic as the market could spring up a positive surprise at any time. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ladi Williams. Back to you. And that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Taniola. The 2021 edition of the African Economic Conference has opened in Cape Verde with the theme Financing Africa's Post-COVID-19 Development. The forum, jointly organized by the African Development Bank, AFDB, the Economic Commission for Africa, ECA, and the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP, brings together various political and business leaders, policy makers, and researchers. Speaking during the opening ceremony, United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed says Africa cannot recover from COVID-19 alone as a worldwide unity is needed. She adds that before the pandemic, Africa was bastard and sustainable economic growth, but the virus disrupted it. The theme for this year's conference, Financing Africa's Post-COVID Development, speaks to the challenges and the opportunities we face amidst the global pandemic. While the health impact of the pandemic has been relatively muted across the continent, African economies will take much longer to recover than their counterparts in developed countries. This is partly because vaccine coverage is at just 6% across the continent. Vaccine inequality could cost African countries as much as $14 billion every month in lost growth and investments. The United Nations stands together behind the WHO Global Vaccination Plan to secure vaccines reach 70% of all people in all countries by June 2022. Africa has many fundamental strengths from its young population and natural resources to the Africa continental free trade area. Before the pandemic, Africa enjoyed sustained economic growth for more than a decade. But Africa cannot recover from COVID-19 alone. We need global solidarity, demonstrated through deep debt relief and increased concessional finance. 
African countries themselves must maximize resource mobilization to enable investments in social protection, infrastructure, and technology. They must also end the illegal outflow of almost $90 billion annually from bad resource contracts and corruption. We need to see concerted efforts to reduce borrowing costs for Africa countries and to engage with non-traditional sources of development finance, including the private sector and remittance flows. And staying with the disruptions due to COVID-19, South African health officials say the country is seeing an increase in reinfections due to the Omicron variant. The new variant identified last week is fast overtaking the Delta variant to become the dominant variant. Simon Pusey has more on this and other international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Health officials say the new coronavirus variant Omicron has now become dominant in South Africa and is driving a sharp increase in new infections. Some 8,500 new COVID infections were registered in the latest daily figures. That is almost double the 4,300 cases confirmed the previous day. Omicron has now been detected in at least 24 countries around the world, according to the World Health Organization. South Africa was the first country to detect the highly mutated new variant. Russian Foreign Secretary Sergei Lavrov has warned that Europe could be returning to what he called the nightmare of military confrontation. At a European security conference in Sweden, Mr. Lavrov floated the idea of a new European security pact to try to stop NATO from expanding further east. The United States remains unwavering in our support for Ukraine's territorial integrity. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned of serious consequences if Russia sought conflict with Ukraine. Diplomats are meeting in Stockholm for a summit at a time of increased tensions between Russia and Ukraine as the former boosts its military presence on the border. Austrian Conservative leader Sebastian Kurz, who resigned as Chancellor in October after he was placed under investigation on suspicion of corruption, says he is quitting politics. The heutige Entscheidung, and das können Sie sich wahrscheinlich vorstellen, the surprise move now leaves a power vacuum in his party. Kurtz has been the dominant figure of his People's Party and Austrian political life since 2017 when he became party leader and then chancellor. He told a news conference he was leaving politics altogether. Germany has announced a new nationwide lockdown for anyone who isn't vaccinated. Angela Merkel and Olaf Scholz, who will replace her as chancellor next week, met with regional leaders to agree on the measures on Thursday morning. Under a draft of the new measures leaked to the German press, the unvaccinated will be barred from restaurants, pubs, cinemas, gyms, cultural events and non-essential shops. They will also be subject to strict contact restrictions, allowing a maximum of two households to meet. The Women's Tennis Association has announced the immediate suspension of all tournaments in China amid concern for Chinese tennis player Peng Shui. Peng disappeared from public view for three weeks after accusing a top Chinese official of sexual assault. WTA chief Steve Simon said he had serious doubts that Peng was free, safe and not subject to intimidation. In good conscience, he said, I don't see how I can ask our athletes to compete there. In response, China said it opposes the politicization of sports. Heavy rains that triggered floods and landslides in central Vietnam have left at least 18 people missing. Many of those are feared to have died, while many houses have been destroyed and roads damaged. Beach towns Phu Yen, Binh Dinh and Vietnam's main coffee growing province were all the hardest hit. The floods have inundated 780 hectares of rice fields, although no damage has been reported so far to coffee farms. Vietnam is prone to storms and flooding. Natural disasters killed 378 people there last year. The Duchess of Sussex has won the latest stage in her legal fight against the publisher of the British newspaper The Mail on Sunday. The Court of Appeal rejected Associated Newspapers' attempts to have a trial over its publication of extracts from Meghan's letter to her father. Her lawyers had said her letter to Thomas Markle in August 2018 was deeply personal and self-evidently was intended to be kept private. In response to the verdict, Meghan wrote, This is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what is right. The Pope has arrived in Cyprus with a message of compassion for the thousands of migrants who have fled to the East Mediterranean island. 
It is the first leg of his five-day journey, which will see him visit Cyprus and Greece, two countries at the front line of migratory routes for people fleeing their countries for Europe. It is his 35th apostolic journey since he became pontiff. And finally, crowds return to New York City's Midtown Manhattan for the 89th annual lighting of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. Officially kicking off the holiday season, the two-hour ceremony contained a series of star-studded performances. The night's highlights came when more than 50,000 multicolored LED lights were switched on, bringing the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree to life. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to Channel Studios in Lagos. Oh, many thanks, Simon. Nigerian powerlifters have again shown their dominance at the ongoing para power powerlifting championships taking place in Tbilisi, Georgia. And I just boss there, Omalayo, earlier today broke the world record in the women's up to 79 kilograms, lifting a staggering world record of 144 kilograms to claim Nigeria's second gold medal. She has now surpassed the world record of 143 kilograms in dominant fashion. <laughs> Antonio Conte's unbeaten start to the league as Tottenham boss continues as they kept pace with the top four with a comfortable win over a lacklustre Brentford, winning by two goals to nil. A 12th minute own goal from right wing back Sergio Canals gave them the lead before Son Heung Min tapped off a scintillating counter attack in the second half. On our table tennis legend, Atonda Musa has commended the Lagos State Table Tennis Association for yet again organizing the ongoing 53rd Ashu Joba Championships in Lagos. An elated Musa, who dominated the competition in the 1980s and 1990s, so the championships has continued to live up to expectations. And that's a wrap on Sports News. And the main news again. The House of Representatives today decided to end speculations on the cost of direct primaries by political parties by inviting INIC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu to brief its committees on the matter. That's News at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antomoka. Have a good night and stay safe.